In this lecture, we will discuss the pharmacokinetics relevant to inhalational anesthesia. Volatile anesthetic induction and emergence have been described ad nauseam, and I expect most people have a decent understanding of the most important factors. Therefore, in this lecture, I'd like to draw your attention to a few of the less known details. Here's a list of things I'd like to cover. Here's the first question. Draw the washing curves for 2% sevoflurane, 6% desflurane, and 70% nitrous oxide between 0 and 30 minutes. Many people will draw the graph like this one on the left hand side, but unfortunately that's not correct. Here on the right you can see the graph from the textbook by Hemmings and Egan, and you can see that the curves have in common the very first upstroke because the physicochemical properties of the drug do not at all affect dispersal into the functional residual capacity. It is only after the drug uptake begins that drugs begin to differentiate themselves. The second thing I'd like to draw your attention to is drug uptake itself. This is another graph taken from Hemmings and Egan. The blue represents the functional residual capacity. The green represents the vessel rich group which is analogous to the central compartment. Note the confusion here. In the five compartment model, the vessel rich group is V1. In the three compartment model, the vessel rich group is V2. Just bear that in mind. The red represents muscle or the lean group, and yellow represents fat. Note that some kinetic models of inhalational anesthesia also include a vessel pore group comprising tissues like cartilage, and an intermediate group, which is thought to be perivisceral fat. Here I've listed three and four in their proper place. Here is the same concept represented with a flow chart. I encourage you to pause the video to compare the numbers listed here. I'd like you to consider the implications of what we've just covered on obesity. What we are generally taught is that obese people have a large fat mass by definition, that volatile anesthetics are extraordinarily lipophilic, which they are, and that we ought to use desflurane to minimize accumulation and avoid unnecessary delays in emergence from volatile anesthesia. Right? Well, the answer is yes, and then no, and then yes again. Volatiles are indeed very fat soluble. Obese patients do of course have a large fat mass. Obese patients are in fact slower to emerge from volatile anesthesia. However, this is not because of uptake into the fatty compartment. This does not delay emergence except in very, very, very long cases. It is instead because of the extra muscle they carry. In the average morbidly obese patient, 20% of the excess mass is lean tissue. Much of that will be muscle. As we saw in the earlier slides, this represents a large tissue mass and a very well perfused tissue mass at that, especially in comparison with adipose. Therefore, instead, Obese patients wake up more slowly because they have a high cardiac output associated with a high rate of drug distribution, mostly to muscle, therefore more extensive drug accumulation. Next we will discuss the significance of alveolar ventilation on volatile kinetics. It's Saturday evening. You have an obese patient undergoing a laparotomy for a small bowel obstruction. You apply the oxygen mask and about half a minute later, the patient is very well pre-oxygenated. Does that fill you with joy? Well, the answer is it shouldn't. What happens next is that your patient desaturates to 80% during your rapid sequence induction prior to you getting the tube in, despite the fact that you are lightning fast intubating. What's going on here? Well, the answer that you may often hear is that the patient is hypermetabolic. Now that may be true, but the other factor to consider is that the FRC may be substantially reduced in the obese, obese patient, particularly if there is additional pathology. Very rapid pre-oxygenation can mean one of two things. Either the alveolar ventilation rate is very high, or the FRC is very low. In this example, a low FRC would explain both the rapid pre-oxygenation and the rapid desaturation. Note that with inhalational induction, it is likewise not the alveolar ventilation, but the ratio of alveolar ventilation to FRC that affects the rate of wash-in. 
The ratio of alveolar ventilation to FRC is in effect a rate constant. The volume units cancel each other out to leave us with minutes to the negative one. The higher the ratio of alveolar ventilation to FRC, the higher the rate constant and the faster the equilibration. You will often hear that gas induction in adults is slow because they have a larger functional residual capacity. This is not the case. In fact, adjusting for body weight, FRC is quite constant from a young age, at about 30 milliliters per kilogram in the supine position. However, minute ventilation is in the child is twice that of the adult. Next, let's discuss the relationship between cardiac output and the speed of inhalational induction. Now we might expect that high cardiac output results in faster onset of induction with inhalational anesthesia because of faster delivery of the drug to the effect site. However, this is not the case. In a patient with high cardiac output, firstly, there is less time for equilibration between the alveolus and the pulmonary capillary with respect to the drug. And secondly, when blood returns to the pulmonary capillary for a second and a third try, it will do so with a lower starting partial pressure. The reason for this is that high cardiac output means high tissue blood flow. High tissue blood flow means accelerated distribution of the drug into peripheral compartments. Accelerated distribution means greater removal of drug from the circulation. Greater removal of drug from the circulation means a lower partial pressure of drug returning to the pulmonary circulation. Let's now discuss the blood gas partition coefficient. Here is a definition that I think you may find useful. What confused me about blood gas partition coefficient initially was the relationship between it and the speed of wash-in and onset of anesthesia. We might intuit that soluble drugs will have a faster speed of onset. However, the opposite is true for volatile anesthetics. In short, if a drug is highly soluble in blood, then more of it needs to be transported into blood for the partial pressure to rise. It is not the amount of drug in the effect site that matters, it is instead the partial pressure that is exerted. It is not the same as the amount of drug in the blood. Here is a diagram which very neatly explains why that relationship is the way it is. One way of thinking about it is that the blood is a much better sponge for halothane than it is for nitrous oxide. Let's talk about the blood gas partition coefficient a little further. Here's a question. What is the blood gas partition coefficient of sevoflurane? Is it 0.7? Is it 0.69? The technical answer is it depends upon the patient. So the way I think of it is that the blood gas partition coefficient is high in a patient who has more fat and cellular material in the blood and lower in patients with less fat and cellular material in the blood. This effect is probably not very significant, but for completeness I've included it here. I expect that the coefficient is also temperature dependent, but that's not something I've read. The concentration effect and the second guess effect are discussed at length in the literature. However, I've included them here in order to provide you with an explanation which uses few words. The concentration effect is a phenomenon seen only with the use of high volume carrier gas such as nitrous oxide. At the beginning of the case, we switch from a nitrogen oxygen mixture to a nitrous oxide and oxygen mixture. This results in rapid uptake of nitrous oxide from the alveolus, but only very slow output of nitrogen into the alveolus because of the large discrepancy in the solubility of these gases. This results in a reduction in alveolar volume and pressure, and therefore rapid inflow of nitrous oxide rich fresh gas. This is in effect an augmentation of alveolar ventilation. As a result we see an acceleration in the rate of rise of FA on FI for nitrous oxide. The second gas effect is likewise only seen with the use of high concentration carrier gas like nitrous oxide. Once again at the beginning of the case we switch from a nitrogen oxygen mixture to a nitrous oxide and oxygen mixture. There is rapid uptake of nitrous oxide from the alveolus, but only very slow output of nitrogen into the alveolus, again because of the discrepancy in their solubilities.
This results in increased concentration of the remaining alveolar gas, and the effect of this is to accelerate the rate of rise of Fa on Fi of the second gas, such as sevoflurane. Diffusion hypoxia is the reverse of the concentration effect. At the end of the case, when we switch from nitrous oxide and oxygen to nitrogen and oxygen, there is rapid output of nitrous oxide into the alveolus, but very slow uptake of nitrogen from the alveolus. This results in dilution of alveolar oxygen and hypoxia. If any of you has the experience of inducing a child in an anaesthetic room and then transferring into the operating theatre proper, you may see diffusion hypoxia. What happens then is that the child is induced using nitrous oxide, oxygen and sevoflurane. The child becomes unconscious, the airway is secured and the drip is inserted. The airway is then disconnected during transfer into the operating room. During that transfer, the child is breathing 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen and can become hypoxic by the time he or she has been connected up to the ventilator because of diffusion hypoxia. The way to prevent this phenomenon is to switch to either pure oxygen or an oxygen and air mixture well before disconnecting the circuit in the anaesthetic room. The same is true at the end of a case when we have been running nitrous oxide as an analgesic. That is, we must switch to oxygen and room air or pure oxygen well before extubation. My explanation of the expansion of closed air spaces seen with nitrous oxide is as follows. We switch at the start of the case from nitrogen and oxygen to nitrous oxide and oxygen. There is rapid uptake of nitrous oxide into the closed air space but slow output of nitrogen from the closed air space because of the discrepancy in their solubilities. This results in expansion of the air space. We will now discuss the relative importance of some of the factors affecting the rate of inhalation or wash-in. Specifically, the presence of right to left shunt reduces the rate of wash-in of poorly soluble drugs like desflurane more so than soluble drugs like halothane. On the other hand, Reduction in minute ventilation or an increase in cardiac output will slow the wash-in of soluble drugs more so than insoluble drugs. I haven't come across a good explanation for any of these things. However, from first principles, I would say that an alveolus full of insoluble drug will equilibrate with its adjacent pulmonary capillary without very much difficulty. And so a reduction in the number of active alveoli is a major factor slowing equilibration between the FRC as a whole and the circulation as a whole. On the other hand, for a soluble drug, equilibration between any alveolus and its adjacent pulmonary capillary is a challenge. Therefore, bulk supply, that is, minute ventilation, and bulk removal, that is, cardiac output, are more important. Next, I would like to discuss the phenomenon of the negative feedback loop during inhalational anesthesia. Let's say you have a patient undergoing a hysteroscopy. You induce the patient, insert the LMA, you attach the tubing to the circle system, and after several minutes, the sevoflurane has reached something like a steady state. The surgery commences, and the patient begins to hyperventilate. And your colleague assures you um, that the patient will self-deepen uh, as a result of the hyperventilation. It turns out this is only the case if the machine has an in-circuit vaporizer. In a circle breathing system with an out-of-circuit vaporizer, the concentration of anaesthetic administered to the patient via the inspiratory limb is independent of the patient's minute ventilation. In fact, if you are using an out-of-circuit vaporizer, the concentration in any location in the body can never exceed that which is set on your dial. The rate at which you administer fresh gas and the rate at which the patient breathes may affect the time taken to reach that maximum partial pressure, but that maximum partial pressure can still never be exceeded. Let's move on to another question. Let's say you're in the cardiac theatre. Your patient's coming off bypass. About half of the systemic flow is from the LV, half is from the bypass circuit. You've recruited the lungs and you've recommenced ventilation. The perfusionist is currently delivering 2% sevoflurane. 
The case has been going on for ages and the body is more or less saturated with SIVO. You want to keep it at a roughly 2%. How much should you dial on your vaporizer? Well, if we look at the question like this, then the answer becomes obvious. Inhalational anesthetic agent passes between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries according to a partial pressure gradient. It is a process of diffusion across a membrane. The answer is, of course, 2% sevoflurane, assuming that the body is completely saturated. The point of this is to demonstrate the peculiar method of drug administration for inhalational anesthetics, particularly as compared with intravenous anesthetics. Let's change tack again. We saw earlier on that high cardiac output results in slower onset of inhalational anesthesia, but what effect does high cardiac output have on the rate of emergence from inhalational anesthesia? Shouldn't it make it faster? Well, the answer is not what you would think it is. Turns out that high cardiac output results in slow emergence and slower washout. I'm going to offer you my explanation for this However, I should warn you that it is simply my opinion. The answer to this question is the same for intravenous and inhalational anesthesia. We'll use intravenous anesthesia for this description because it's easier. We all know that offset after a single bolus of propofol is faster if there is a high cardiac output state due to accelerated distribution. However, with offset after a longer case, the opposite occurs. The reason, as far as I can tell, is this. In order to achieve and maintain a desired depth of anesthesia in the patient with a high cardiac output, we need to administer a higher infusion rate. This is because the rate at which drug is distributed and therefore taken up by the peripheral tissues is increased. During offset, the concentration will fall to a lesser extent during the distribution phase and more of the decrement will occur during terminal elimination, which is of course a lot slower. It's the same story with inhalational agents. After a case of any reasonable length of time, high cardiac output will result in slower offset because we had to deliver a higher inspired partial pressure to achieve and maintain the desired depth of anesthesia. Here's another way of looking at it. High cardiac output results in faster offset after a short case due to a higher rate of distribution. However, high cardiac output results in slower offset after a long case because of a reduction in the extent of fall during distribution and also an increase in the rate of redistribution. We've covered a lot in this lecture, and so it's hard to include uh, in a summary of everything, but here are a few points which it might be useful for you to take home. Firstly, Wash-in curves have a common initial segment representing equilibration between the circuit and the lungs. This is important for your exams. Secondly, inhalational uptake occurs into several hypothesized compartments with very different equilibration times. Thirdly, obese patients accumulate anesthetic agent primarily because of a large lean mass. Fourthly, self-deepening does not occur in circle systems with an out-of-circuit vaporizer. Lastly, high cardiac output results in delayed emergence from a given depth of anesthesia, whether inhalational or intravenous.